So this morning, I am going to share something that God has been, what I recognize now, been trying to teach me and ingrain in me for many years, but something I've been only realizing and learning how to apply effectively within probably this last year. And it's called contentment. <laughs> now, when we hear that word, everyone can relate. Um, who here, if they gotten told no or told to wait, had that little infantile feeling of that instant tantrum of going, no, or I don't want to, or yeah. It, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So the definition of contentment is the state of being contented, um, peace of mind, satisfaction. Now, when I say contentment, not necessarily contentment in just anything. It's contentment in the Lord. And only us who are here who have, you know, surrendered our lives to Christ will understand that um, contentment in the rest of the world won't make sense to anybody because it's only temporary. Now, the opposite or the counterfeit of that is discontentment. And one of the definitions, which I found quite interesting, was a restless desire or craving one does not have. And one of the biggest examples in the Bible, which started from the very beginning, and is not a new thing, is when Eve was confronted by Satan. And little by little, he crept in and told her of something that she didn't have, which caused her great demise. Hers and Adam's it brought her husband down with it. Um, so I want to just debunk a few misconceptions that the world says contentment is and then shed some light on what God says it is. You know, misconception number one is being content is being weak. We're told in this world that, you know, if we're content or if, if we're just okay with everything, that, you know, you're not moving forward or we're told, you know, just do it or, you know, go and be an achiever or you go girl or you go guy and you know we can tell everyone else you know not they can't tell us what to do we're mr or miss independent we can do what we're, we want and it's just a form of rebellion that satan wants us to believe in god's truth on contentment is contentment is power um, there is grace and humility and it's total opposite of what this world teaches um, and we find that in the verse, um, which everyone knows, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And another truth that we shouldn't, uh, we should remember is contentment shouldn't be confused with complacency. Con being content in the Lord of where he's placed you doesn't mean that we're complacent. We have verses um, such as James 4, 7, and you can jot this down if you're taking notes. You know, if we're submitting to God, we are actively resisting the devil. It's not something that just happens, but if we're submitting to God, it's an active form of, of spiritual warfare. We're actively resisting the devil. And we also find another form of being active in Hebrews 12, 1, where we are actively told to run the race of faith with endurance. So we're not just cr sitting ducks, you know, just waiting around to, okay, God, you know, I'm going to only budge when you pick me up and move me there, but we are actively doing what God wants us to in the place that he's placed us, in the season that he's placed us in. Now, that being said, these are a few points that God has shown me on how to be content, because believe me, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not something that um, is easy to some people. For some people, it is. That's great. Um, but it's something, when I ask God, Lord, teach me to be content, it's like asking God, teach me to be patient. What is he going to do? He's going to start bringing situations in your life that's going to cause you to test your patience. So he's going to bring situations in your life where he's going to cause you to test your contentment in him and your trust in him. The first thing that I've learned is to recognize uh, the enemy, Satan's scheme. I know now that anything Satan causes me to feel rebellious against if if I f you know get confronted with something or a situation or get told by someone or something no 
And any form of rebellion in, rebellion in my heart is Satan's way of wanting to rob me of what God has best for me. Like, I don't know, but I can trust that whatever situation or season God has placed me in, it is preparing me for that passion and desire and that plan that I know I am praying for in my life. And I can trust that a loving father won't give me anything less. And that Satan knows that, and he wants to do everything he can to create itch miles in, my, in our lives and to get me to run out of seasons that God is trying to grow me in and miss out on what he has uh, best for me. So verses I have for that point is 1 Peter 5, 8, and you can, tr- you know, briefly s- turn there with your Bible. And the speaker is the slowest today. Here we go. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, we've heard this before, but devour what? Devour us physically devour us just to trip us up no devour everything that god has wants for us and he did that to eve he you know god had this perfect plan but god gave them a choice but it was satan was actively seeking out to destroy what god had made as good ephesians 6 10 through 12 jot that down or turn there with me this is us recognizing that it's a spiritual warfare. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against uh, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we can know that anything that we encounter, we need to look past it. You know, what is God's truth about it? And what is Satan trying to do in my life? And actively uh, pray against it, you know, and actively turn to what God is telling us to do. Examples of Satan's plot in our lives is, of course, the one that I mentioned with Eve and Satan. And another one is Abraham. Hagar and Ishmael, and you can jot this down. I kind of briefly touched upon it. That's Genesis 16, verses 1 through 6. And Abraham and Sarah had waited so many years for Isaac. And God had promised. God, uh, Abraham heard God's voice that he was promised Isaac. He waited years and years, and I know many of us here, you know, we hear God's voice, and we're waiting years and years, we're waiting so long, and we're in a place that we don't want to be, and Abraham, instead of waiting, went and created an Ishmael and took matters into his own hands. The second point that I want to make is recognizing our need for God, that he is a loving father, knowing all of our needs, desires, passions, He also knows our struggles and our areas of growth that we need to grow in. And Uncle Israel had said this maybe a few years ago, but it stuck with me. That saying, you know, we don't trust God, or we can say that we trust God, but acting out as if we don't trust God and making our own plans and going against his will is pretty much accusing Abba Father of child neglect. And that's a pretty serious issue because if God is this all-knowing father, all-loving, he has a perfect plan, yet we don't trust him. It is basically telling him, you don't know what you're doing. Um, Verses I have for that that we can remind ourselves with is Psalms 139, 13 through 18. Most of us know it is, you know, he's formed our inward parts. He knows the thoughts that he has towards us. He, he knows every intricate detail, um, even before we knew it, before we were born, before our parents knew it, before our grandparents knew it. Knew it. Um, and Jeremiah 29, 11, you know, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. The third point is to cultivate a heart of thankfulness. Now, 
we can find every reason to not be thankful and find something to complain about. We can become chronic complainers, um, which we are, at least I know for myself, I've fallen into areas where, you know, I've found something to complain about. And if we turn to Colossians 3.15, or jot this down, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Now, we can't have contentment without peace. And having peace in God and is the thankfulness that we have in knowing what he's done for us. That he loved us first. It wasn't us that loved him. And then Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And going into seven, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Point four is to seek after we have cultivated this heart of thankfulness that we're just so overwhelmed by this amazing love that our Father has given us and we are humbling ourselves before him, then we need to actively seek each and every day to know his will and his heart, to surrender and submit to him daily. People are, I hear a lot of people say too, you know, I don't, I don't know what God wants me to do. You know, I don't, want, I don't know what God wants for me. I, I found myself in that situation, but it was only until I realized it wasn't what God could do for me. It was, you know, what, what is it, Lord, that you want for me? And it goes back to that verse. You know, he loved us first. It wasn't us. It wasn't the other way around. So it, in this me-centered culture, the focus has to be shifted to what is it that God wants for us because it was him that did everything. Matthew 6.33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Now, it doesn't give a time frame. It doesn't say a place, but we know that if we seek him first, all of his best will be added unto us. Psalm 143.10. Teach me to do your will. And this is David. For you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. And then the fifth point is to grow where we're planted. And one of the most poignant verses I can use to describe this point is Esther 4.14. And this is when she didn't understand she was placed in the kingdom where she didn't want to be. She didn't want to be queen. She went years and years of preparation and milk baths and the verse is saying, you know, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And this is the main part of the voice uh, verse that I would like for you guys to remember is, yet who knows whether you have come to this kingdom for such a time as this. So wherever you are planted, wherever God has you, you can trust and know that God has you for such a time as this. And what are you doing where you're planted? If you know, like I have a specific language, I have a specific uh, ministry that I, I just have such a passion for. And, but I'm not in the place that I know God has called me in. And, you know, I could sit there and have a tantrum about it and say, well, okay, well, when I get there, then I'll start growing in it. Or I can find out, okay, God, you're trying to grow me where I'm at. You have me here for a reason. What areas can I grow in? Who can I pray for? What ministries can I attach myself to to cultivate what you're trying to grow in me? And then the last point overall is I want to leave hope that for those who may have exited their season or for those who have discontinued contentment in the Lord and have created Ishmael's or, um, you know, have stepped out and settled for second best, God's not done with you. You know, if you're breathing and you're here on this earth, God still has a plan for your life. 
And the few verses I want to leave for that is Isaiah 61, 3. Isaiah 61, 3. Also, Lamentations 3, verses 22 through 23. And I'll just read this briefly. Isaiah 61, 3 says, To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And then if you're at Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, I'll read this briefly as well. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your mercies that are new every morning. I thank you for your great faithfulness to us. Again, I just pray that over your body, Father, you would just pour out your spirit of shalom on them, that you would remind them in the night watches and during the day that your plan is so amazing for them, that anything less would just rob them of the miracles you want to do in and through their lives. Bless each and every person here. I ask for grace and, we n and a recognition of us needing more and more of you. Thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. What I'm going to be sharing about, first of all, aloha. Aloha kako. Good morning. And I'm going to be sharing about something we're reading about in our devotionals for our away team. So we're going on a mission trip, and every day now we're reading scripture, um, praying about something, just preparing our minds for our trip. So this is from day two, and it's Philippians. It's going to be the main text. Philippians 2, 14 through 15. All right, and the New King James Version says, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Another translation, NIV, says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. That's beautiful. Okay, and I can say for myself that this came at the perfect time when we read this scripture. I was literally, I was talking to, um, I think it was Malia, about some this area. And so when I found out this was our devotional, I was just so stoked. So God is faithful. Uh, the week before this, I want to say about a week ago, uh, something happened at work. And it was honestly a huge misunderstanding. And um, stuff happens. One thing leads to another. And there's, you know, anger on both sides, frustration, maybe hurt. Grudges are formed, all that stuff. Not fun. But when I stepped back and I was just thinking of what just happened, I began to realize that none of this would have happened if grumbling and complaining were not involved. Like, it literally wouldn't have happened. And so this really made me, like, step back and think of all the times in my life, personally, that, you know, a privilege was taken away or you know, I made a mess of something or something wrong happened with because I chose one of these things or maybe even both of them. I mean, to be real, five pulled out of gymnastics for, you know, arguing with the coach. At 10, I, like, put an end to a guitar class for complaining about something to the teacher. I mean, really, if you think about it, even for yourselves, I mean, because I was looking at it, I'm like, I, I don't have to think very long. Like, most of my track record is made from these two things honestly, but um, for yourselves, like, honestly, think about it. The, the things that go wrong and, like, even day-to-day -day drama that's so unnecessary, 
a lot of it is caused simply by complaining or you know grumbling about something leading to arguments and stuff like that and people really honestly don't realize the effect by the way that it has on people around them okay they don't realize that you know it's it's not just like okay yeah it's your opinion but it can be so heavy weighing on people around you and uh, the way i see it is that if you've let it complaint complaining is contagious literally contagious if you let it okay i'm gonna bring up a point here so say you're on a road trip we went on a family road trip yesterday i will say it didn't happen yesterday but it normally does so you're on a road trip and there's one person that's like oh, i'm so thirsty all of a sudden i'm thirsty too like what's up with that? or i'm hungry it's like complaining all of a sudden it's like i feel like I haven't eaten in days. Bethany is always, okay, I'm calling you out. <laughs> All right. You know, anything like that. Complaining is just like that. It's like when you hear someone going off, it's like suddenly I feel like I care about it too, even if I didn't. Um, another situation you can imagine is like you're in a workplace, okay? You're in a workplace and there's someone going off because there's always someone going off about something, okay? So they're going off and it's like, it's kind of like they're rallying people. Like, they're all passionate. Like, come on. Like, you agree with me on this? They're like, ra- like, they're rallying the troops. Like, are we about to go on a riot or something? Like, or a strike? No. But it's like they'll find things to complain about, even though it's a great day. You know, you're having a great day. And so this can be, you know, an eye-opener. Even for myself, it's like, man, people around me can hear. So even if it's a little complaint, like, I, I – just refrain because I don't want to put that on someone else, you know, keep it to myself. Um, and so actually in our workplace, I work with Shiloh and my cousin, Tevita at Moana Cafe. And it was, <laughs> it was getting a little bit much, you know, at a workplace when you're surrounded by that sometimes negativity and complaining about something, it's just, it, we- it weighs you down. And so I, w- I got to a point where I was just feeling really dry and I was just like, God, like, am I shining here? Like, you know, what's happening? So here I am, like, looking at the big picture, waiting for an open door. And don't get me wrong, God has given me open door, open, open door, over open door. But sometimes you won't have an open door, and that's okay. Look for the window. It's not as big as the open door, but you make do. Okay, so in my case, it's it's not the, okay, I'm waiting for this encounter with this coworker, but it hasn't happened yet. But instead, God's like, all right, here you go. Take this. Here's a situation where everyone's arguing, cussing, you know, frustrated about something. And he's like, all right, well, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to, you know, continue on in this complaining session? Are you just going to turn around and be like, I'm grateful. And I give thanks to God for everything I have, you know, and give praise to him. So it kind of connects with what Lindsay was saying about being content. To be content, you can't have the grumbling and the frustration and all that comes with that. You, It's open hands and surrendering and being like, I can't control the situation, but I'm not going to, you know, get angry and frustrated and rant about it. I'm just going to be content in him and be thankful. Um, another encouragement is that um, actually – the day that I got back to work after reading this passage and kind of coming back with a new perspective and every morning I'm like, God, give me new strength and joy. And so this day was a great day and I was just, the joy of the Lord was with me. And a couple came up to me and we started dialoguing and talking and they're like, I think the husband, he said, what church do you go to? I was like, oh, how'd you know? He's like, oh, I could tell, I could tell. And so we start talking and their church is going to Israel, which is amazing. Um, the wife tells me, she confronts me, and she says, you know, thank you for shining Jesus' light. Keep shining. And I'm not saying that to, like, put it on me, but I want to turn it around and encourage you guys that if God is telling you to encourage someone, because I really needed that. I was like, thank you. (laughs) I was so blessed. So if you guys ever feel that tugging on your heart or, you know, to encourage someone or to just um, speak life into someone, you you don't know what their day was like. You don't know what they're going through. Even if they're Christian, some people are like, okay, I'll save that, and I'll go talk to the unsaved. 
But no, as, you know, siblings, children of God, we need that encouragement from each other. So that's just an encouragement to, to go for it if God gives you a word for someone. And in closing, um, as we've seen complaining and arguing and all that stuff, it's, it leads to the downfall and it doesn't lead to something great. So clearly to be thankful and to be grateful and everything will lead to a blessing. So in closing, this is a very, very short, short verse. It's 1 Thessalonians 5.18. So 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, every single circumstance, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So I encourage you guys, I hope you're encouraged to, um, even in a dark world when everyone around us can be negative or trying to tear us down, I just pray that each and every one of us each day would just take, take the new day and say, God, I commit this into your hands and give me the joy of the Lord. Help me to be content. Help me to be thankful and grateful in all things. Thank you. Uh, Aloha. Ohana. I just want to say uh, those two words were fantastic. I agree. It's amazing how we didn't get together and talk about stuff before we wrote all this out. We weren't given a blueprint. So um, the Holy Spirit has a, an easy way about together and hopefully he'll uh, allow you to see that connection in uh, what I'm about to share. I want to be talking today about uh, Matthew 13 if you want to go there and this is uh, interesting for me because it's uh, the story about Jesus speaking to a large crowd and this uh, crowd is so large he has to get out in a boat and in the course of the uh, uh, sharing, he makes the decision to uh, tell the story in what's uh, called a parable, okay, which causes some questions to occur among uh, the folks that are with him. So starting in uh, verse 1, on the same day, Jesus went out of the house, sat by the sea, and, a great mu and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Okay, so we have uh, probably potentially thousands of people because he fed 4,000 on one occasion, but we got, a, we got a big crowd. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and, and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. All right, now in these thousands of people, was he talking to a group of individuals who were all born without ears? Probably not, okay? So when he says, let those who have ears hear, Okay, what ears is he talking about? Well, he's got to be talking about something other than physical ears. He's talking about our ability to hear what he's saying in the spirit. See, we all live and operate in a, in a physical world, and we have five senses, and that's what occupies our attention over 90% of the time. But what's more real and what's actually eternal, see, all of this someday is going to go away, okay? But what is spiritual is eternal, and that's the part that Jesus was most specifically trying to get our attention about. So, uh, and uh, the purpose, okay, so, and the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? Okay, so we have two groups of people, all right? We've got the disciples, and then we've got everybody else, okay? So now, who are these disciples? Okay, well, the, the classic definition of disciple is, Somebody who follows with the intention of doing. Okay? I could ask the question, who here wants to be a disciple? Hopefully everyone would raise their hand. You know, so the counterpoint would be, who doesn't want to be a disciple? Because that's the group that's everybody else. Okay? So the disciples, those who follow with the intention of doing, 
say to him, why do you speak to them in parable? They're a little concerned because they realize that this other group may not be getting in on the spiritual significance of what it is Jesus is sharing, okay? And so he answers them, and he says to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Whoa, sounds like a little discrimination. So because it has been given to you to know the mysteries, okay? What are mysteries? Why should it be a mystery? Seems like you just make it real clear so everybody can get it. But we have this aspect of something being not able to be understood unless you have another condition that is in place, which is this condition of discipleship, okay? He said to them, it's been given to you to know the mysteries, okay? So something that cannot be known, you're going to get to know it. And the reason you're going to get to know it, because it's one of the benefits of following Jesus with the intention of doing what it is he wants us to do. Well, so what's in the universe of mysteries? Okay, what's in that universe is some of the things we just talked about. Um, you know, we talked about the disruptive events in our life, okay? And so everybody's in here, we can all, you know, do well in church and we're with our brothers and sisters, but unfortunately, other than this two or three hours, we've got to go out here and live the rest of the week in the world, okay? Now, unlike most of you, um, my wife and I have been married for 40 years, but we had one of those relationships that was very dynamic, very passionate, and often a little um, unstable, okay, in the sense that she would offend me or I would offend her, mostly me offending her probably. But, um, but net up, you know, that had the potential, it, and it in fact did disrupt our harmony, okay? So I had gotten uh, a piece of information, however, from a man of God at one point, and he said whenever you – Feel these things coming up in your relationship between you and your wife that tend to t drive you apart, okay? In other words, you're having an argument. I know none of you have had an argument with your wife, but I, in fact, did have one every once in a while. So, um, you know, when you have these situations, that these arguments that come up, okay, what you should do is the husband should hold the wife and pray. And, in fact, I decided one day in the midst of one of these arguments to do that, okay? So I walked in and I go to hold my wife because she was in the attack mode at that point. And, um, and, of course, she did not just go, oh, thank you for praying. No, she was like, eh, get away from me. I want, you know. But I just, being bigger and stronger, I grabbed her and I said, oh, God, help. We need you, okay? And right at that point, a piece came in which broke, you know, the, the justified, I'm sure, argument she had, broke the justified resentment I felt like I had, and instead we were able to come back into oneness. Well, why is that important? Well, it says that, you know, as husbands, we're to maintain our relationship with our wives because it's critical for our, our prayers to be effective, okay? So what, what am I talking about here? I'm talking about mysteries, okay? Everybody should have at least known somebody that got in an argument, okay? But isn't it much better to be able to get on the other side of that because we don't get married to argue. We get married to enjoy the, the blessings and the, you know, the wonderfulness of a, a best friend and a relationship of being connected and having all these positive emotions that go with a marriage. Guess what, folks? We're the bride of Christ. Okay? How, is, how important do you think it is for us to be connected to Jesus? You know, how important is it for us to be able to maintain that communication and that connection so that we can enjoy the benefits of his love and his goodness helping us get through these situations that for in my case I consider them to be not fair okay it's not fair that this happened or that happened or or whatever but you know it allows us to put aside what we consider to be not not fair because we often have to you know face the reality the fact that um, perception is reality okay so I'll see something one way and another person will see it another but for me that's my reality so if I look beyond myself, then I'm able to then go beyond resentment, beyond that's not fair, and all the things to interrupt contentment and get back to the place of one with the oneness with Christ because that's where I'm going to be effective, not just as a, a servant and a disciple, but just in being able to have a contented life, which is what I'm interested in. Um, Jesus went on to say, for, for, let's see, for whoever has, to him will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. 
Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand, and in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you will see, and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. So today, I'm looking at my heart, wanting to know, is my heart in a condition of dullness, or is my heart in a condition of sharpness, okay? I don't know what the correct word for that is, probably not sharpness, but anyway, um, being sharp, how about that? If you've ever used a knife that was dull, trying to cut a piece of meat, not a lot of fun, okay? Ever tried to use a set of shears or a pair of scissors that are dull? No good. If somebody says to me, hey, you're a real dullard, I don't go, wow, what a compliment, okay? I instead am like, uh-oh, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm obviously not making a good impression on this person. So uh, it's the same way with our relationship with God. Is God going to look at me today and say, dull of heart, hard of hearing, or is God going to look at me in these circumstances once I get out of here and once I'm out facing all these people I face in the world and saying, okay, he's on it, I'm with him. Okay, and just to conclude, I can tell you for sure Jesus already promised us that in this world you'll have trouble. The good news is he's overcome the world. So I used to be when I got into the trouble, I was like, oh, God, deliver me. Okay, I want out of this trouble, which is a logical, normal approach to have. But what's changed since I've been here is I now, when I experience the trouble, I now move toward the trouble. And the reason is because of exactly what you said earlier, I'm, I'm learning to trust God more. Okay, and I recognize that the only way I'm going to get through this situation is by allowing my faith to exercise his grace, okay, his unlimited power for me. That grace is directly connected to my faith. That's why he says faith is more precious than gold, okay, and he's continually working to help us develop that faith. You're going to have trials. You're going to have tests, but God is bigger than all of it. I don't care how big it is. But we're only going to get to experience his deliverance to the extent we're willing to trust him. So anyway, that's uh, my word for today. Thank you, and I hope you guys uh, have a great week. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Destiny. Thank you, William. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day you've made. Thank you for allowing us to come into your presence and to worship you and to encourage one another and to fellowship and just to try and be your body on this planet. Um, I wanted to uh, close this out in a time of corporate prayer. The pastor was asking me if we could do that. And um, before we start on that, I just wanted to share a little bit about the body of Christ, uh, Kirk mentioned it, I believe, in his greeting, and um, Destiny in her prayer during uh, worship time here was talking about the unity of the body. There's an interesting verse in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul introduces uh, this metaphor of the body of Christ in his letters, and um, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22, it says, and he put all things under his feet, referring to Christ, and he put all things under his, God the Father and Christ, he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It's kind of an amazing verse 23 there, referring to his body, being the fullness of him. I think about, this might be a little heretical, but it's just sort of running through my mind recently that Christ, you know, we always think of him as the same all through eternity, and he is in a sense, but something happened at the cross. Something happened when the church was born, and, you know, we became his body. It almost is saying, you know, this is the fullness of him now, that he's the head, we are his body, and that, you know, without his body, he's really not full. And um, obviously, we're nothing without the head. You know, we're just a decapitated corpse. But 
it's just amazing the significance of the body of Christ that we are, that we're, and um, how important it is for the unity of the body. And um, Destiny was was mentioning that, and you know Jesus prays for that in John 17, and Paul also talks about it in Ephesians. I'll just briefly, chapter 4 and verse 3 says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Um, it's so sad to see all of the um, denominations and divisions of the body. And I think that's one of our prayers is, you know, for the, for the church, for the body of Christ to just more unity and so that we can be the hands and the feet and the ears and the eyes. And, you know, Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. We can be that body that responds to his commands and be effective on this planet in terms of expanding his kingdom. And um, so as we pray um, this morning, just think of, think of that, that you know, we are the body of Christ. And, um,